as we dive into a new year, there's always, I think for me, the sense of, of opportunity. That's why I, I, I like transitions. I, I like those moments where I can put the things in the past that I really want in the past and begin to create a future that I always wanted to be my present, but wasn't quite there yet. And I feel like sometimes I've been given a curse. I have bigger dreams than I have a bigger me. How about you? I feel like sometimes the match between my aspirations and my talent were not considered ahead of time. You ever feel like you're trying to cash in a dollar check, but all you have is 38 cents in the bank, and you're like, I'm just trying to figure out how to make up the difference. I think it's one of the reasons we come to moments like this. I know we're supposed to be searching for God. But I don't know if we're actually searching for God. I think we're searching for us. I think we're trying to figure out our lives, figure out ourselves, and, and, and whether it's in a context like church or whether it's in a business environment, whether you're reading a book or inspired by a film, I think all of us have this sense that, that we've been shortchanged, that there's something missing inside of us, that, 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 that significant differential that will finally let us live the life we long to live hasn't yet been actualized or activated in our souls. So I want to talk to you about expanding your capacity. Wherever you are right now, I I want to talk to you about expanding the universe within you so that it has a dramatic effect on the world around you. See, one of the things we we sometimes overlook about Jesus, and 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 it's easy to overlook because after all, when someone says they're God, it's sort of like owns the story. But even if you don't believe Jesus is God, even if you, you're, you think that's all mythology and, and, and you think it's, it's insane to think that God would take on flesh and blood and walk among, walk among us, Jesus is still an incredible study. I mean, I mean, if Jesus isn't God, the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the greatest study of human leadership that has ever existed. Because we have one man who was born in obscurity, in some small town called Bethlehem, raised in a place called Nazareth, and born to no prestige, no power, no authority, no fame, started in a deficit under the oppression of the Roman Empire, and the son of a carpenter who doesn't seem to exist in his life after the age of 12. And he becomes the most influential figure in human history. And he takes 12 people. They're, They're not the best choice. I'm just going to say, no offense to Peter and John and James and really what did Bartholomew ever do or Nathaniel or Thomas or all those guys. They don't seem to be the best choices. And, 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 and there seem to be some other people that grouped themselves to Jesus. And man, it seems there were some prostitutes involved and, and some tax collectors. And there was a criminal element around Jesus. And, <laughs> and the religious leaders were not really inclined to listen to him. And he seemed to have no appeal to the institutional leaders at all. No religious or political power. How did this man affect the internal structure of the people around him to such a degree that their entire lives were shifted? And they somehow found the capacity to influence an empire whose singular goal was to oppress them and limit their influence. And here now, 2,000 years later, all around the world, people are choosing still to follow him. And so even if you don't accept what Jesus says about himself, you have to ask yourself, what are the leadership principles that Jesus can teach me so that I can increase my capacity? And frankly, I don't want to make you all better leaders. That makes me a little nervous. (laughs) See, I, 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 I don't want to make people better leaders if they don't want to become better people. Because we don't need more people leading who have more power than they have character. And so I I don't think we... I don't think we need more great leaders. I think we need more great women who lead, more great men who lead. And and so there's this moment in the life of Jesus. And remember, everything written about Jesus isn't there just to give us history. It's to give us perspective. 
And there's a moment, in fact, there's two parallel moments where Jesus, he uh, feeds the multitudes. Once he feeds 4,000, once he feeds 5,000. And they're two different events, but they, they really have a lot of similarities. And, and, and in the middle of it, Jesus is trying to teach his followers how to expand their capacity. In Matthew 15, beginning of verse 29, it says, Jesus left there and went along the Sea of Galilee. Then he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Great crowds came to him, bringing the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others, and laid them at his feet, and he healed them. This is just the setup. The people were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled made well, the lame walking, and the blind seeing. And they praised the God of Israel. So this is the context. Jesus is walking around, and extraordinary things are happening. People are amazed. The sick are being healed. The blind can see. The deaf can hear, the lame walk. And then in verse 32, it says, Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion for these people. They have already been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry, or they may collapse on their way. His disciples answered him, where could we get enough bread in this remote place to feed such a crowd? I think this is great. The setup is Jesus is performing all these miracles. And then he says, we need to take care of these people. And they're going, where can we get enough resources to feed all these people? How can we possibly provide for all these people? And I see Jesus heals the, the sick. But where can we get the resources to feed all these people? Like Jesus can make the, the paralytic walk, but, but how can we solve this problem? And, and, and they're so focused on the problem, they don't actually see the possibilities and the potential that is right in front of them. And, and Jesus says, I have compassion for all these people. I think he begins here because he wants them to understand why he's about to do what he's going to do. And he's actually think defining the difference between them and him. See, sometimes you might think the difference between you and God is God's power. So oh, well, the reason I can't do what Jesus did is because I don't have the power that Jesus had. But actually what's really missing for us is not that we lack the power of God, but we lack the compassion of God. See, we don't need God's attributes, we, we need God's character. And what Jesus begins here is he, he begins to show his, exam, his disciples how they can expand their capacity by reminding them they need to expand their circle. He said, I have compassion for these people. I do not want to send them away hungry. And his disciples were like, you know, where are we going to get enough bread? You, you, you ever had a, a problem in front of you, but you just felt like the problem was too big for you? And you abdicated responsibility for the problem because, well, you didn't have the resources to solve the problem. See, I, I'm convinced one of the things that God does in our life is that God expands our circle of compassion and responsibility. See, I think most of us want God to expand our circle of influence. God, make me more influential. We don't really want to say, God, make us more famous because we don't know if he'd really do that. But you go, God, make me all the things that would make me famous. God, give me more, more, give me more talent. God, give me more skill. God, give me more ability. God, give me more charisma. God, give me more of everything. But really what he wants to do is give you more compassion. He wants to change the core of who you are. And he says, I, I have compassion for these people. And that's why we're not going to ignore them. They're like, Lord, we're feeling you. We understand that you care about these people, but it's just not realistic. See, one of the things I know about God is he's never going to call you into something that's realistic. He's going to call you to something that's bigger than you. And if you have a vision right now that you're big enough for, your vision is not big enough for you. Because your vision should be so big that it overwhelms you. See, whatever you care about, you should care about so deeply, it should burden you so profoundly that it almost crushes you under the weight of its importance. And he says, I don't want to send them away because they're hungry and I care about them. I have compassion for them. But his disciples didn't. They were not there yet. The parallel passage in Luke chapter 9 has a very similar kind of introduction. It says, late in the afternoon, the 12 came to Jesus and said, I love this. Here they're proactive. Send the crowd away so they can go to the surrounding villages and countryside and find food and lodging because we are here in a remote place. Yeah, I wonder how many times God sends you a problem. They're called a human. Yeah. You ever notice that almost all of your problems are a human? We, we call them other things. You have financial problems, relational problems, 
You have career problems. Every problem you have is a human problem. And the problem, of course, is that you think it's a human problem about another human, but it's probably a human problem about you, the human. And they want to push the problem out of their circle. Lord, send them away so they can go get food. In fact, they're being really proactive. Let's get them out of our circle before we have to actually care about them. And Jesus said, no, we're not going to push them out of your circle of influence. I just need to push you into their circle of concern. I need you to care about them so I can do something great in you. So when they say, Lord, send them away, Jesus' reply is, you give them something to eat. Man, I, I hate when God puts it on me. I'm like, really? You're God. I'm human. You can take more. You have greater capacity than me. And, and it's almost like God saying, I know. You have very limited capacity. We're going to work on that. We're going to expand your circle. We're going to expand your capacity. We're going to expand your influence by expanding your compassion and expanding your responsibility. What are you willing to take ownership of? You ever notice that, that whenever there's a crisis in the world, whenever there's, there's uh, some kind of tragedy, on social media, there's always our thoughts and prayers, our thoughts and prayers, our thoughts and prayers. And thoughts and prayers are good. But I don't know if you've noticed, but it seems like people who do not believe in God, they hate that phrase. And in fact, they, they almost feel in, in, incited and in, in angry by their phrase, thoughts and prayers. See, I don't think any person who doesn't believe in God is against thinking. I think they're forethought. And I don't really think they're that against praying. I just think they're against apathy. I think the reason they, they feel so offended by the phrase, our thoughts and prayers go out, is that's code word for, I'm not going to get involved. That I, I'm going to put all this on God and none of this on me. See, I, I think people without God have a, a really keen insight on the reality of this. That if it hasn't come back on you, there were no thoughts and prayers. Wow. See, if you keep trying to put all the problems of the world on God, it means you're not letting God put any of the problems of the world on you. And here, they have a, a problem bigger than themselves. They have thousands and thousands and thousands of people to feed. So there's no way of saying God would never put anything that big on you. But here Jesus says to them... What are you going to do? How are you going to feed them? What do you have? You give them something to eat. See, I, I think a part of the problem with faith is that it makes us apathetic. It paralyzes us. Sometimes it gives us a, a language of abdication from the problems of the world. There is no human problem that God does not hold us responsible for. And you... You haven't connected to God with thoughts and prayers if your thoughts and prayers haven't moved you to action. God wants to expand your capacity, but he, he wants to deepen your concern so that he can expand your influence. And after you expand your influence, you also, your, your circle, you need to own what you have. I, I, I love the conversation that goes on from here. Jesus asked them, how many loaves do you have? Seven, they replied, and, and a few small fish. I like how they have to add small. Because having seven loaves isn't a problem enough, right, when you have 4,000 people. And having just a few fish, even, really, if you, even if you had, like, large fish, couldn't you say, well, you have a few large fish. But they're just not large enough for 4,000 people. But they want to make clear to Jesus that they don't have enough. We have seven loaves and a few small fish. I thought fishermen are supposed to exaggerate about the size of their fish. We just have a few small fish. And Luke, Jesus says, you give them something to eat. And they answered, we have only, I like that word, only five loaves of bread and two fish. They counted. And later we know it wasn't really theirs. They stole it from some kid. <laughs> Unless we go and buy food for all this crowd. There's about 5,000 there. See, and here's the dilemma. Most of the time in our life, we engage life from a framework that we just don't have enough to accomplish what we need to do. And, and I know this. There's a sense of inadequacy, a sense of, of insignificance that all of us struggle with. I, I, I think even people who look like narcissists and who act so overconfident, so arrogant, it's just an underlying fear that they're not enough. Hey, have you ever felt like God just wasn't really generous with you? You know, not, not what, what he has given you, but what he put into you. Have you ever looked at other people and thought, why didn't you make me that talented? God, why didn't, why didn't you make me that gifted? 
I, I, I watch, I mean, we live in the middle of the most talented people in the world. It can be overwhelming. God, why couldn't you just be a little bit more generous with me? And, and here's the beautiful thing, is that some of you are here, and you're, the way you think about yourself, you're just five loaves and two fish. If we, if we just kept peeling away at who you are, you would just say, I'm not enough. I'm not smart enough or gifted enough, talented enough. I'm not educated enough. I'm not enough. Someone else may be enough, but I'm not enough. And there's some of you here, and you're paralyzed from the life that God wants to take you into because you've convinced yourself there's not enough in you to do what God has called you to do. Wow. <laughs> and I think this is why this is so important, because Jesus doesn't need a lot. He just needs you to own what you have. You need to take ownership for what God has put in you. Now, some of us think of, of human characteristics like intelligence and, and talent as limited commodities. You, you're just so smart and so talented, and that's just the way it is. And, and I don't think we talk enough about intelligence in church. We just ignore intelligence. It's almost like if you're spiritual, you don't have to worry about intelligence. You should. <laughs> but the truth is, there are people in the world smarter than me, and I, I hate that thought, but it's just true. <laughs> there are people smarter than me in my own family. It's just not any fun. But I can always, you know, find some solace. There's someone out there dumber than me. <laughs> there, there are people who are more talented than me, and, and there's some who are less talented than me. There are people who are taller than me, and there are people who are shorter than me. And, and, and here's the dilemma sometimes, that you, you spend your whole life comparing yourself to what other people have and what other people are. And so the problem is you'll either always live with a deep sense of inadequacy because you measure against people who have more than you, or you have a sense of arrogance because you measure yourself against people who have less than you. And really what God wants you to do is take ownership for who you are for what you have, for what he's given you. And by the way, this is my life experience. It's not limited. I don't know what the scientific research is behind this, but you can be smarter. I know this, because I've been dumber. <laughs> I know this. You, you, the talent is not a limited commodity. You just have so much talent. You can keep expanding your talent. I, I think it's so funny because it, it just, it, it's a little awkward bit going, it's funny to me how many places people go, oh, oh, he's a genius. And I went, I barely graduated from high school. No one would have ever called me a genius. But I realized, oh, what happens is if you just don't give up, eventually people think you're a genius. <laughs> I've just been around 60 years, and so now I just look smarter than I used to be. Because <laughs> eventually hard work looks like talent. And determination looks like genius. And, and what God wants you to do is take ownership of what you have. So you don't, stop complaining about what you don't have. Stop complaining about what you are not. Start taking ownership for who you are and what God has placed in you and be the best you can with what you have. <laughs> you just have to take ownership and go, I don't care. I don't care how many times I have to be bad at this. I'm going to keep doing this until I'm good at it. I don't care how many times I'm just good at it, I'm going to keep doing it until I'm great at it. You cannot become a strong communicator if you're not willing to humiliate yourself with bad talks. You cannot become a great writer if you're not willing to embarrass yourself with bad sentences. Whatever you want to be or do in your life, you have to own it. You have to own the resource God has placed in you and become resourceful with it. I just have a few small fish. And seven loaves, what do you want to do with it, God? It's all yours. Then when you, when you own what you have, then you need to find your intention. See verse 36 and 37, it says, Then Jesus took the seven loaves and the fish, the small fish. And when he had given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and they in turn to the people. And all ate and were satisfied. I thought, well, this is unusual. Is this the same? In Luke, listen to verses 14 through 16. But Jesus said to his disciples, have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. The disciples did so, and everyone sat down. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke them. Then he gave them to his disciples to distribute to the people. We've always misunderstood this passage. Both of these. See, we talk about Jesus 
feeding the 4,000. And Jesus feeding the 5,000. But that's actually not what happened. Jesus never fed the 5,000. Jesus never fed the 4,000. The disciples fed the 5,000. The disciples fed the 4,000. See, we, we keep attributing to Jesus what Jesus wanted to make sure we attributed to his disciples. See, Jesus never performed a miracle for the 5,000. Jesus performed a miracle for the 12. And then the 12, in turn, turned that miracle into the miracle for the 5,000 and the 4,000. See, here's what to me is amazing is that they gave Jesus what they had, even though it wasn't much, they, they owned what they had, and they gave Jesus what they had, and then Jesus gave thanks for it, which I think is kind of interesting, because, you know, Jesus is God. So he goes, thank you, you're welcome. <laughs> See, I, I think what Jesus was trying to do was trying to let them know that what they've given him now has the intention of God. And then you know what he did with it? He gave it back to them after he broke it. One of the most terrifying things in the world is to give God everything you have. Because then you're going to have nothing. But what you have feels like nothing because it's not what you need. And so it's odd that we hold on to what doesn't satisfy out of fear that we'll never have enough. And they gave Jesus everything they had. And then what Jesus did is he broke it and he thanked God the Father for it and he gave it back to them. And this is the beautiful thing. See, God wants to take everything you have. He wants you to give it to him. And he wants to give his intention to it and then he wants to give it back to you. But when it comes back to you, it has a force and power that it did not have before you gave it to him. So no matter how intelligent you are, how talented you are, how awesome you are, I'm telling you, you will never achieve your full capacity. You will never find the full impact God wants to make on your life until you give everything you are, everything you have to him. And when he gives it back to you, it's different than it was before. And they in turn gave it to the people. I think this is a missing line in our faith. See, so, so much of the conversation of God's generosity is how much God's going to give to you. But you see, God did not give them those loaves and fish back so they could hoard it to themselves. It would have never multiplied to the masses if they had not given them what they had away. E even your talent, your skills, your intelligence, your passions... As long as they're focused on yourself, they will never achieve their fullness. You will never know your full potential, your full capacity. You will never fulfill your intention or destiny. It's when you give it away, when you move towards surrender and service. And when Jesus gave it back to them, he didn't even give them an instruction. They, in turn, gave it to the masses. And it multiplied over and over and over again. So you're always going to feel like you are in a deficit if you're just trying to live your life for yourself. Your talent's always going to feel really limited if you're just trying to use your talent for your own fame. You're always going to feel as if it's not enough and you're not enough if everything you're trying to do is just for you. But the moment you surrender it and you give your life for service, no matter what your talent is, whether you're a doctor or an architect, whether you're a teacher or an actor, whether you're a writer or an artist, whether you own a company or work for someone, the moment you decide to give your life away to others, your life finds its intention and fulfillment and God expands your capacity. And then, of course, the beautiful thing that happens as this whole story wraps up, it says afterwards, the disciples picked up seven basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. And the same thing happened in Luke chapter 9. In verse 17, it says, they all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. It's interesting that in both the different stories, they had more than enough. And in both of them, 
They picked up basket after basket after basket, one with seven, one with 12. They actually ended their story with more than they began. See, here's the amazing thing about God and the way that God's designed everything. If you learn how to be generous, if you learn how to give yourself away, if you learn how to serve other people, if you trust God, say, God, it's all yours, all my life, all my hopes, all my dreams, all my talent, all my passion, all my intelligence, all my relationships, God, everything I am and everything I have, I give to you. I'm telling you, that's how your capacity begins to maximize and grow. Because when you hold it to yourself, you're hoarding it and making it less. But when you give it to God, you're entrusting it and it grows to more and to more and to more. There's some of you, and you're afraid to love, and so you, you hoard your love. You won't give it away. And what you found is a world that is loveless. See, you will never find love until you give love. There's some of you here, you're searching for grace, but you don't give it. You'll never find grace until you give it. You'll never find forgiveness until you give forgiveness. It's a strange thing. In fact, in our context, we have a lot of people that talk about the universe. How the way the universe works is that if you, if you send it out, it comes back to you. And I understand why people talk like that. Because when I was a kid, I believed in Santa Claus. I didn't know it was my parents buying the gifts and giving credit to Santa Claus. I got older and I realized it was my mom buying the gifts. Santa Claus really was just my perception of their generosity. See, if you don't believe in God, it looks like the universe is actually sending back to you what you send out to it. But that's because you don't know that there's a God who created the universe, who designed the universe to work in this kind of economy. But I can tell you this. The way God has created the universe is that if you hold on to love, you will never know love. If you hold on to bitterness, you will never know forgiveness. If you hold on to your despair, you'll never know hope. But it's a beautiful thing. See, the moment you decide, God, I'm going to trust you with my life. I'm going to give everything I have. I'm going to give everything I am. I'm just going to surrender and serve. I'm going to live my life in compassion and passion. I'm going to live a life of love and hope. When you give it away, it comes back to you a hundred times over again. It's a beautiful thing. See, love never exhausts itself. You, you, don't, you don't have to worry about loving too many people too much. If you just keep loving and loving and loving your capacity to love, it just keeps growing and growing and growing. And it's just like a few loaves and a few fish can feed thousands. The love that began in you small will become eternal and infinite. Just a little bit of hope. And the moment you start giving a little bit of hope away, it's amazing what happens inside of you. Hope begins to grow inside of you. The moment you, you just start expressing a little bit of compassion, it's amazing what, how it changes you from the inside out. Some of you have a universe so small inside of you because you've been afraid to love, afraid to trust, afraid to serve, afraid to give your life away. And Jesus is saying, oh, if you could just trust me and give me everything you have, what I would return to you is so much more than you could ever imagine. See, Jesus was trying to teach his disciples to trust in the return. They didn't know when Jesus blessed those few fish and loaves that they would walk away with an abundance. I could have never imagined when I made a decision to follow Jesus, when I made a decision to surrender my life to him and to try to live a life of sacrifice and service, how much more would be returned to me than I could have ever given. So much love, so much laughter, so much joy, so much hope. Every good thing that has ever been created is of unlimited capacity. So why shouldn't you? Why shouldn't you be overflowing with hope and with faith, with forgiveness? with freedom, with life. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and give it to you in abundance. So here it is. Your life, to God, it's just existence. It's just like a few loaves and a few small fish. But Jesus wants your life. He wants you to give him your life and he's gonna take it and break it. Give thanks. He's gonna give you life back. 
He's going to give you life in abundance, more than you could have ever, ever hoped or imagined for. That's why Jesus stepped on this planet, why God became man, why he walked among us, why he allowed himself to be crucified on the cross, why he became the sacrifice for us, why he rose from the dead so that when you are ready to give him your life, he would be ready to give you his. Would you just bow your heads with me just for a moment? Just close your eyes. There's some of you here right now, and it's time for you to cross the line of faith. It's time to you to give God your life. Maybe you feel so broken and inadequate, and you just know that there's just so much of you that's shattered. Here's the beautiful thing. You just give God your life, the one you have. Give him all of you. Give him yourself and all of your imperfection and all of your pain and all of your fear and all of your doubt and all of your brokenness. And Jesus will give you his life right now. The greatest exchange you will ever know. So I want to lead you in a prayer. It's just one sentence. One sentence that will change your life forever. One sentence where you cross the line of faith. One sentence where you trust Jesus with your life. One sentence where you give him yourself and he gives you himself. Here it is. Jesus, I give you my life. That's it. There's so much more you and God will talk about. But this is where the conversation begins. Jesus, I give you my life. Right now, would you just whisper those words to God right now? Would you just make that your prayer right now? Jesus, I give you my life. He's waiting for you. It can begin right now. Jesus, I give you my life. Breathe deeply of his life. It will expand your soul and make you new. Jesus, I give you my life. If that's your prayer right now, I want to pray for you. If right now you're ready and you whispered those words to him, Jesus, I give you my life. I want you to right now without hesitation, without embarrassment, without shame, I just want you right now just to hold up your hand high and say, yes, this is my prayer. Jesus, I give you my life. Beautiful. Anyone else? Right now. Beautiful. All over the room. Anyone else? Try and just hold it up high. I want to pray for you. Right now. Jesus, I give you my life. Anyone else? Right now. This is your moment. This is your moment. Father, I thank you for those that in this moment have opened up their hearts to you and said, Jesus, I give you my life. I pray, God, that in this moment you would just wrap them up in your life and let them know that they belong to you. I pray that right now, God, would be the defining moment of their life. That they would follow you, Jesus, no turning back, without hesitation, without fear, without shame. And may your life pour into them in abundance. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we just thank God for those who responded to him? So good. What an incredible message from our lead pastor. Pastor Irwin, thank you for just a message that has breathed on far beyond even the moment you gave it. And I can't wait to reflect on the insights that you shared. And, and this is gonna be a really beautiful week as we apply this message to our lives. And I know there is some of you today that you made a huge decision to trust Jesus with your life for the first time. And if that was you, first we wanna just say welcome. There will never be a more powerful decision that you could make than the one that you just made to trust Jesus with everything. And we wanna help you as you begin this journey of faith. And so if that was you and, and you crossed over the line of faith today, what I want you to do is I want you to grab your phone and I want you to text the word DECIDED to 71711. And what's gonna happen is someone from our team will, will reach out and will follow up with you and we're gonna give you tools to help you thrive in this new journey that you're walking with Christ. So again, grab your phone and text DECIDED to 71711, and we can't wait to connect with you. Man, it's been an amazing day. Uh, I hope you have heard from God in a profound way today, and I, I can't wait to see the all God has for us next week. We'll see you then.